All right, so hey everyone. I'm really excited to be mic'd because I'm one of those guys that never talks loud enough. <laughs> um, so my name's Tom Petter, and I'm an infrastructure tech lead at HubSpot. And I'm here to talk to you today about how we move the entire HubSpot product on, from legacy hardware onto a Mesos-based platform as a service. You're probably wondering what the heck even is HubSpot? Uh, well, we're a sales and marketing software company based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we provide tools that helps your company grow. So we allow you to get found, uh, acquire and nurture leads, and convert those leads into customers. And you can do that with all these different tools up here. You're probably thinking, that's a pretty big <laughs> surface area. Um, and it is. The HubSpot product is really large, and we're competing with multi-million dollar companies in almost every category. Um, so that's a lot of fun. But from a numbers perspective, we're over 100 different engineers spread between Cambridge and Dublin. We have over 1,600 different deployable items, so we really take a microservice architecture to heart. Um, engineers typically do 300 daily deploys to production, and you can even go from a Git push to having your code live in production in customers' hands in about 10 minutes. And the only way we're really able to do this, achieve a high development velocity with such a large app, is due to the culture. Um, our engineers own the end-to-end -end success of their products. They're the ones that make the decisions, and they're the ones that end up wearing the pagers. We don't have an ops team in the classical sense of the term. We don't have people babysitting your code. You know, when, if you push a bug or if you deploy a service that's not, um, not performant, you're the one that's going to get paged. And it's a really cool culture because it really instills um, you know, ownership and craftsmanship. Um, you know, when you meet customers, and like, I used to be on a product team before I was doing infrastructure, and I went, when I met customers who used my app, it was so exciting because, you know, that was like my baby. <laughs> um, so it's all really good, but like anything, it also comes with drawbacks. And one good example is how we histor historically spun up services. So you'd start by developing locally. I hope everyone does that here. <laughs> Um, when you're ready to share your service with others, you'd provision some hardware for our QA environment, which is our testing environment. So what you'd do is you'd go to this tool called Rainmaker, which is essentially HubSpot's version of the AWS console, and you'd have to pick some hardware. And that's where your first issue comes in. You have to decide what size machine to choose and how many of them do you need. Uh, do you scale, or do you err on the side of caution and choose large machines and maybe don't use all the capacity? Or do you err on the, on the side of saving HubSpot some money, maybe hit scaling issues down the road? Once, you, once you've made your decision, uh, you have to wait 30 to 40 minutes for these machines to get uh, spun up. So that's, you gotta wait for Puppet to run, you need to wait for firewall holes to be punched, you need DNS entries to be updated. But once you're all squared away, then you can de deploy your code using a local Python script. And what that script did was it would SSH into the machines, lay down your code, start it up, and if you're deploying a web service, it would also log into our load balancers and tweak some configurations there. If anything got interrupted during this process, things could be in an inconsistent state, which is less than ideal. Um, so you test your thing in QA for a while. You're ready to go to production. You repeat the same <coughs> process again. You choose what machines you need. You spin them up. You deploy. You'd think you'd be all set, but we run an Amazon, and things break all the time. So sooner or later, you're going to get a page at 4 a.m. You know, notifying you that your machine is gone or you know, your error rates are up or something. And you've got to re repeat this process yet again. So we were looking at this, and we realized we don't want to spin up a team that's just going to babysit our developers. But we do need a team to make these processes easier and faster, more automated, and less confusing. And that's where the PASS team uh, came to be. So our PASS team. And I dare say PASS in general is all about empowering developers. It's about giving them good tools and a solid foundation so that they can focus on what they do best, which is making products, not managing infrastructure. And Mesos, for all this, had been on, um, we had our sites on Mesos for a long time um, for a number of different reasons. We spun up our first Mesos cluster in September 2013, which <laughs> feels like ages ago now. Um, and Mesos was really attractive to us because it allowed us to abstract away the concept of a machine. Instead of developers you know, spinning up QA and production hosts and having to replace them, they just you know, run their thing in this sea of resources, and they slice and dice what they need. 
it also allows us to promote a homogenous environment instead of developers having to decide, okay, I need you know, three C3, you know, two XLs for my service. Uh, we can just buy the largest machines Amazon provides and again, s slice and dice as needed. One fun fact is the new M4 machines that Amazon came out with are partially thanks to feedback that we gave them where we were unhappy with the ratio of CPU to memory in their offerings. Mesos also gives you the ability to scale out specific processes. This is really nice for things that you know, consume from a queue. Um, say, in our old email system or in our old analytics pipeline, when things got backed up, you'd have to go through Rainmaker and provision more machines again, go through this whole deployment process, which would take a long time, usually when time was of the essence. But with Mesos, you can just say, oh yeah, that email service or that analytics service, run more of those. And then when you're, you've, you know, uh, chewed through your queue, scale it back down. Oh, in a similar sense, Mesos provides you a centralized service registry. I'm, I'm going to admit something for a second. Before we had Mesos, if my boss came to me and said, I need to know everything that's running in our data center, I need to know what services are and what hosts, I need to know what build they're running, and I need to know what ports they're listening to, <laughs> I would probably be running around with my hair on fire. But with Mesos, you actually have all that information right there, just a few API calls away. But just like the Apple guy said uh, earlier today, you, Mesos alone is not enough. You need a framework. We went down the custom framework route as, as well. We made uh, something called Singularity, and we started in October 2013. And we really, when we were designing it, we really looked at what did our developers need? What, what, what was taking too long? What was confusing? What could we do to make their lives easier? And the, the first thing we identified was, what are the different workloads that make up the HubSpot product? So it's four different things. Web services, background workers, cron jobs, and one-off tasks. So those are all first-class citizens in the Singularity framework. And we put a lot of focus into the interface. Um, you can see here, this is what it, how a developer views a service. So they can very easily, without needing to SSH or manipulating machines at all, look at what tasks are running, what tasks have run, were they killed or did they fail, and they have easy access to scaling up or down, pausing their service, bouncing, what have you. Developers can also go in their actual tasks and see the timeline of how they ran. They can see resource usage and health checks right there. Again, no SSHing or finagling required. They can check the, the Mesos sandbox and get really easy access to files. Just like the Mesos API, you can tail files. But unlike the Mesos API, or uh, UI, we also pre-install these tools on every developer's machine that lets the, them tail and grep services from the command line. That's very useful as well. In addition, we have notifications. So developers get emails when their task fails, and it says what failed, a link to view more information about that task, and uh, re recommended courses of action. In addition, we have what we call cooldown mode, which is where if your service is consistently failing over and over again, we try running it less to protect, protect the cluster, but we also stop emailing you because the last thing, if you have you know, multiple failure emails in a row, you probably don't need 100 more of them. <laughs> also from an administrator perspective, we give you a really nice overview of everything that's running in the cluster. You can see this is the singularity hosts, uh, driver status, uh, when it got the last offer. We can see everything running in singularity. We can see what services are in cooldown, and we can alert on that. We can see all the tasks that are running in singularity. We can alert on tasks that are overdue. We can see the racks and slaves in Singularity as well. And when you click into slaves, you can also perform administrative actions on them. So one benefit of building our own, that's weird. Uh, one benefit of building our own framework and having control of the framework and the executor is when Mesos didn't have features that we needed, we could zip ahead and implement it on our end. Uh, one thing that Mesos is now getting that we've had for a long time is the ability to freeze or decommission a slave. Freezing means don't run any more tasks on this slave, and decommissioning means relaunch tasks on other slaves. And this has been really useful for rolling restarts and applying security updates and just digging into slaves when, when we have issues with them. 
I'm remembering now I'm supposed to call them agents, but <laughs> it's really hard to change, change your ways. Uh, another thing that we built into it is uh, access control lists and authorization. One of, the big, uh, one of the big things we had to work on when we were moving all of HubSpot into it was taking these sensitive systems, these systems that are locked down, like billing um, and things like that, and making it so random people, say interns, co-ops, or people who just aren't supposed to be seeing you know, credit card information or sensitive email information and prevent them from deploying or viewing logs. So we got that built in too, and that's all running off of LDAP. But singularity itself is not enough. We also need something to handle load balancers. And this is where our Baragon API comes in. We're a little schizophrenic when it comes to, to project names. We were, we we're all into Godzilla monsters for a while. Now we're all into space things. So you're gonna have to bear with me there. But what Baragon is, is it's a service that Singularity or any other thing can hit to request load balancer updates. So you can hit Baragon and say, please add these hosts into this, load, into this load balancer group, or please remove these hosts, blah, blah, blah. And Baragon will fan out those updates to all of our Nginx servers and apply the changes. So we began our QA migration in December 2013, and it lasted until about 2014. And essentially what it was was just a heck of a lot of pull requests. And what those pull requests were doing were changing these deployment configuration files we had. There are YAML files very similar to Heroku's proc files that said, for this service, what do you need to run? What server should it run on? And any other kind of hints about load balancing or sizing information. So we looked, when we were generating these pull requests, we looked at historical data about memory and CPU usage and tried to, to provide hints in the, in the configuration there. Uh, but it, was, it wasn't all, it, it, it didn't go as smoothly as we hoped. We bumped into a, f a bunch of different issues. Uh, the first one was services depending on local file system state, which if you've used Mesos at all, you know that's kind of a big no-no. Um, it was funny because for the longest time, we talked this big game about how you know, HubSpot, we've embraced the 12-factor app model. You know, all our services you know, are stateless and you know, can work on ephemeral hosts, but what we realized is that when you let your developers do anything, they're gonna do everything. <laughs> so we had to work with a bunch of different teams to refactor their apps to not depend on this file system state. In a similar vein, we had this special deprecated setting in our deployment configs called single process running. And some services needed that because they couldn't handle you know, two instances of it running at the same time which is exactly how Singularity does deployments. It's gonna spin up new services and only kill off the old ones when we know that the new ones are healthy. So again, we had to work with feature teams on that. We had a bunch of different services that depended on stationary hosts. So that just meant it was deployed to a host and its host name was just hard-coded everywhere. So we had to do work there. But I think the biggest problem that we had to work on was memory isolation. In some ways it was kind of nice because Mesos, it, helped us find all these latent memory leaks that we're hiding in our product. This is a really nice graph of a node service <laughs> that just kept dying. Um, and the reason why this was hard is because of the C Group's mem memory isolator. I like to describe it as um, that quote, you know, talk softly and carry a big stick. It's gonna let you request as much memory as you want, but as soon as you go over that limit, it's just gonna kill dash nine you which is not the best way to die. Um, so it really, it really got us thinking about how to properly size our apps. Um, and we went from a world where when you're deploying a Java service, most of our backend services are Java, you'd just be setting the max heap. But now what we have to do in the, in the Mesos world is we take that max heap that you requested and we figure out how much memory will the JVM actually use. And it, the equation came out to something like max heap plus stack size times how many threads you expect to use, plus uh, overhead for the garbage collector based on your mass heap, ma the max heap, plus some JVM overhead, plus any extra off heap memory you plan to use. And that helped a lot. Our biggest fear throughout this process was inconsistency. We were going from a very direct world where you know, there's a script SSHing into hosts, running something, and then SSHing into more hosts and tweaking some configs. Now you're submitting requests for the intent to run something. Those things may run, they might not, and if they're web services, they'll eventually be updating load balancers. And 
it, and we, we kind of, we, we had a, a lot of feedback like this from developers. There's this death by a thousand cuts of little, pe little moments of inconsistency. And they're, they're realizing, I, I don't want my service to go to production if this is what it's going to be like. So it was a lot of um, bug fixes and changing how people thought about things. The first thing that we did that made a big difference was we introduced a two-phase commit process between Singularity and Baragon. What that means is during the deployment process, Singularity will reach out to Baragon as normal and say, OK, please add these hosts to this load balancer. And Baragon will say, OK, I'm working on it. And Singularity will keep checking, OK, what was the status of that, of that operation? And only when Baragon says, yes, all hosts have it set successfully, then do we consider the deployment a success. Another thing we had to do is change about how we thought about the team. So when we first spun up the PASS team, we, we almost thought about it like a HubSpot feature team in the sense that you know, we had a production environment and we had a QA environment. We did our testing in QA, and you know, when it was good, we deployed to production. But you can't really think of an infrastructure team on the same level as a feature team. Uh, the PASS team at HubSpot is almost more of a company inside of HubSpot, and the developers are the customers. So what we realized is, QA, if all of QA is broken, that's still, that's still a big deal. So QA, in our eyes, is still production. And we had to make this new environment called test. That's our QA. We test that without HubSpot developers using it. Once we know that it's good, we roll it out to QA and production. Finally, we bundled all these things together under you know, version 2. Uh, it's pretty funny how you know, just slapping a V2 on something can make people you know, kind of reset their expectations. So we had Singularity V2, Baragon V2, it's all very good. So just show of hands real quick. Who's affected by this? Nice. Yeah, we were affected as well. So the Amazon Reboot Apocalypse was essentially, uh, there was a security issue found in the hypervisor, and Amazon essentially had to reboot a large percentage of their fleet. Um, but the funny thing is, this, this slide looks really scary. I th this is like the top image result for Hellscape on Google Images. But it was actually a turning point for us, because developers were getting these notices saying, hey, your machine's going to reboot in two days. And they realized, OK, I can take time out of my schedule to you know, reprovision all this hardware and redeploy the world. Or I can just move it onto Mesos, and these guys can handle it for me. And from our point of view, it's very easy, because we saw, OK, this percentage of our Meso slaves were going to reboot. We'll just spin up you know, replacements that we confirm with Amazon are good. We'll decommission the bad slaves, and then go on our merry way. So if we didn't brag about it so much, we would, no one would have known anything was wrong. <laughs> uh, so we finished up our production migration in February 2015. Um, again, it was just a million pull requests. They all got merged. Um, it's all very good. But you're probably wondering, does this all work? And yeah, it powers the HubSpot product. It, um, people at Evertrue, sitting right over there, use it as well. Uh, people at OpenTable, who may or may not be here, uh, use it as well. Um, so a bunch of people use it. Uh, for us, in production, we've launched over 8 million tasks so far in 2015. And I am absolutely sure that I'm jinxing myself by saying this. I'm sure my phone is going to just start buzzing right now. But we've had no critical situations caused by this Mesos infrastructure. So now I have two, really, uh, two graphs that I'm really proud of. First one is a graph of our production machines, if, if this screen will stop spazzing out, that is. Um, so the yellow line is the number of app servers. So those were the, the machines that developers were uh, provisioning on their own through Rainmaker. And the blue line way down there is our, uh, our meso slaves. So you can see it's, it's kind of going way up, almost constant rate, until about uh, August 2014, and it just shoots down. And that was thanks to everyone moving their things onto Mesos. So a lot of, co a lot of cost savings there, but more important, importantly, a lot, of, a lot less management that we have to do. Uh, having less machines is always a big win. In addition, when you crunch the numbers, I've always wanted to say when you crunch the numbers. So when you crunch the numbers on, singular, on, on Rainmaker, you can see after we move to Mesos, people using it has gone down, which means people are manipulating our infrastructure less often. 
that is always good. Um, so we've had a lot of stability benefits and cost savings benefits, but we've also been able to do some really cool things with uh, Singularity and Mesos. And one of them is this project called Wormhole, so back over to the space theme. That's a client-side lo load balancing library. And basically what it does is it allows us to avoid hitting our load balancers. So historically, when we've made API calls, we make the same calls that our customers would hit when they want to hit our API. So if they want to hit our contacts API, we'd be hitting hubapi.com slash contact slash blah, blah, blah. That would mean an entire trip you know, out through our ELBs and then back in, which is wasteful in terms of money and just time. So what Wormhole does is it's aware of, our, of this service registry that I was talking about and transparently to the user, checks the URL and sees, oh, I know what that URL is. That's pointing to these hosts. And it's even as smart as saying, okay, I know that you're in this availability zone. I'm gonna route it to the machine that's also in your availability zone. So you can save money that way. Another really cool thing, uh, a really, another really cool service that we've been able to empower with Mesos is this thing called Facsimile. And that's a near time, near real time email automation and intelligence system. And basically what it is, for people who have opted in of course, this looks kind of scary and like NSA like <laughs> just alone, but for people opted into it, we keep a persistent IMAP connection to their Gmail inbox so that we can do automation and intelligence on it. And that's spread over 60 instances. So if someone came to me before Mesos and said, hey, I want to run a service that has hundreds and thousands of open connections, I would have been like, oh, okay. But with Mesos, I can, I can just say, okay, I can give you 3,000 connections per host, just run it on 60 instances. That in itself is really cool, because before, if someone said, I want to run 60 instances of something, <laughs> all right, you're going to be in Rainmaker for a really long time. You're going to be replacing a lot of hosts. But thanks to Mesos, we can just run it on 60 instances. Another thing that we're doing is we're moving other pieces of our infrastructure into Mesos to, to gain the, the benefits that we've seen in our app. So we have this project, again, back to Godzilla Monster, it's called Ghidorah, which is like a three-headed winged beast, apparently. And what that is is Mesos-based load balancers. So we're taking Nginx and our Baragon agent, the thing that we'd install on in our normal load balancing hosts, pack them into a Docker image. Those things are run in singularity, and it's allowed us to absorb 40 standalone instances in QA alone, which is really, really nice. The newest thing we're working on, again, back to the space theme, it's called Blazar, which is an out-of-this-world build system. And it really strips build down to the basics. It's GitHub webhooks going into singularity, kicking off Heroku-like build packs. And we're looking to replace our Jenkins infrastructure with that as soon as possible. So my TLDR for you right now is we run our product in Mesos, and you should too. We invested in a custom scheduler because we started early, but you don't have to do that. There are many good options out there. And I work at a marketing company, and you always have to have a call to action at the end. Otherwise, they get mad at me. Uh, my call to action to you is try out Singularity today. Um, it's the best framework you've never heard of. So. Uh, so that's it. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so that was the um, decommissioning thing I was talking about. It'll reschedule all the tasks on different slaves so that you can take it out of rotation or do whatever you want with it. Yeah. Well, basically the way it works is it's the normal build pack life cycle. So, you know, detect, compile, release. Um, we're, in terms of building the artifact, we're still, we're, we're not fully in on Docker yet. Um, because most of our app is Java, we've essentially treated jars as our container for a long time. So with Ghidorah and um, with Blazar, we've actually been moving towards 
taking these build packs and making them work in a Docker system. Um, th does that answer your question? Or? So we don't, we don't have one way in one container yet. The way it works is the build packs you know, emit their build artifact. We tar that up and put it on S3. Your deploy config, a separate YAML file, actually says, OK, with this artifact, run it this way. So. Anyone else? Cool. Well, thank you very much.